Okay, so I am going to, to change to a slightly different version of a talk um, today. I want to thank Marinka and Yure for inviting me to speak and would like to thank all of the other speakers for sharing their amazing research. Um, want to point out I have no conflicts of interest and what I hope to do is speak briefly about the SPARC program here at Stanford and our COVID-19 repurposing efforts. Um, some of the challenges that we found in repurposing advancing drugs to patients and discuss a couple of proposed solutions. So SPARC program has been at Stanford now for approximately 14 years. We have three missions. One is to educate our faculty, our postdocs, and our graduate students on the translational process so that they can take promising discoveries that have potential to benefit patients and move them down the applied science pipeline so that can become a reality. Um, in addition to education, we take in about a dozen of these projects per year and work with them over the course of two to three years to try and advance them to the point where they can be either licensed out to a startup company or existing company or to be moved directly into the clinic. Often the latter is the case with repurposed drugs. And then the third area that we work in is we wanna promote more efficient and cost-effective means for improving the drug discovery and development process. As you are all aware, um, the current enterprise takes 10 to 12 years, can cost over a billion dollars, and the failure rate, particularly after we get into clinical trials, is abysmally high. Only 14% of drugs getting into humans actually uh, are ultimately approved by regulatory agencies. So what do we do? We try and bring together academic scientists with scientists from our local biotech ecosystem. And we have over 100 volunteers who sign CDAs and come meet with us on a regular basis. They teach many of our seminars. They also work directly one-on-one -on -one with our project team. So we get together every week on campus, uh, sadly by Zoom now during the COVID epidemic. It's evolved so that there's no hierarchy. There's very free sharing of ideas amongst everybody in the room. A first year grad student can challenge a Nobel laureate. The industry advisors are really the folks who have the most power because they actually know what they're doing. Uh, importantly, we don't try to aim to reach a consensus. We are really just trying to provide our teams with information so they can make the decision regarding how they want to advance their projects. So we teach starting at, at the end product in mind, starting at the end and really figuring out what features we need to incorporate into our projects so that they will be embraced by patients, providers and payers uh, as required. We give very modest funding, approximately $50,000 a year based on milestones. We try and teach project management skills because our time is our most prescient asset. We really focus on product development focused education. Um, we provide mentorship, as I mentioned, by our industry veterans. And we also try and provide introductions to potential collaborators, to companies, to contractors, CROs, people at other academic institutions who have requisite expertise. As Nivan was saying before, this is really a team effort, um, team science, if we want to develop new drugs. Um, and we focus just a wee bit on the entrepreneurship skills towards the latter part of the calendar year. Um, Sparks track record over the past 14 years, we've graduated 117 projects. Um, approximately half of them have been licensed out to companies, predominantly startup companies. Another 17 we brought into clinical trial here at the university ourselves. And 44 have failed to progress, either failed proof of concept or the team just was not able to execute. Um, we love repurposing at Spark. Of the 176 projects we've taken into Spark so far, so far, 46 of them have focused on repurposing existing drugs. Of these 46, 17 have been licensed out to companies. Another seven we've brought into, into clinical successful clinical studies here at Stanford. We have eight of those that are still active. Um, Interestingly, the source of repurposing projects, where does the idea come from? The vast majority come when um, one of our scientists identifies a new target that happens to be important in a particular disease or disease process. And then they go to the literature to look for drugs that either have on or off target binding to that target in question. 
Um, our second um, source would be, the second most fruitful source, source would be computational screens. Uh, we've used VJ's ligand-based screening. Uh, we've used other screens looking for repurposing drugs, including one that Marinka uh, ran with us. Um, we have used a tool Butte's uh, approach looking at omic changes in diseases and then looking for drugs that induce the reverse of those omics changes. Uh, and we've also mined clinical data uh, looking for impacts of drugs. Um, the third way we find repurposing projects is when we're conducting high throughput screens. Um, we will virtually always run a repurposed library uh, as our first effort out the door. And we've been lucky. We've identified more than a handful of drugs through these um, repurposed libraries. And then lastly, clinical observation. We have a couple of cases where an astute clinician uh, noticed that a patient who had more than one illness when they were started on a drug, their second illness uh, dramatically improved. However, repurposing on the face of it sounds easy, but it turns out to be very hard, largely to get the funding necessary to advance clinical trials. Um, unless you have protective intellectual property to allow people to ensure they get a return on their investment, um, investors are highly unlikely uh, to invest. And in terms of getting federal money or foundation money, you have to be lucky, you have to be in the right place at the right time at, with the right request for proposals uh, in order to get funding to advance those projects. Um, the biggest challenge is with generic on the shelf drugs. These would be ideal for patients. They're the fastest to the clinic, uh, would be ideal for the healthcare system because they're gonna be the least expensive of drugs, but they're almost impossible to get funding for the clinical trial. Um, I wanna talk briefly about a couple of COVID-19 repurposing efforts. Uh, we have a handful in Spark already, and um, one of them I, I know um, we recently heard mentioned about um, the hyaluronic acid pathway, and one of them is targeting that with a drug approved in Europe, Europe uh, by Professor Paul Boyke um, using hymecromone to target uh, hyaluronin synthase. I'm gonna mention two that I've been working on. Um, and I really arrived at these sort of in the old fashioned way of following my nose in the biology and the literature, um, tracking what was known about SARS-CoV-1 at the beginning of the pandemic. And as more information came out corroborating similar pathways in SARS-CoV-2, we gained more confidence. I wanna talk about the clinical picture. Um, I'm an internist, uh, I do practice and see patients. And COVID-19, I think we were aware, aware of some of the pathology before it was actually published um, just through clinical experience. So as you all know, the leading cause of morbidity and death is acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. Um, interestingly, patients often seem early in the course to develop hypoxemia that's out of proportion to the damage to the lungs or loss of lung compliance, suggesting ventilation perfusion mismatching. Um, patients' second leading cause of morbidity and death is myocarditis. Um, there is an increase in inflammatory cytokines, including those listed on the slide. Um, but perhaps less so than we see in standard um, bacterial-induced sepsis or ARDS. Uh, and importantly, these patients tend to have endothelial damage and thrombosis leading to blood clots, um, deep venous thromboses, pulmonary emboli, but also small emboli uh, in the smaller blood vessels that are often not picked up until autopsy. So we have a variety of approaches we take to COVID-19. Um, we can target the host response with vaccines or other forms of prophylaxis. Um, we obviously can target direct antivirals against viral um, proteins or pro viral protein host protein interactions. Um, where I've been focusing is more targeting on trying to block the pathophysiology of the negative host response uh, to try and prevent inflammation, try and prevent blood clotting, et cetera. And I've been focusing mainly on the renin angiotensin system and the associated P38 MAP kinase signaling pathway um, using two drugs, one called the linistatin, the other angiotensin 1.7. And of course, we've also just become much better in intensive care. And I think this is one of the chief reasons that patients are surviving uh, at higher rates now uh, versus several months ago that probably dexamethasone and the, a lower age of patients who are now presenting to the hospital.
uh, some observations that we could glean from the literature early in the pandemic is that the highest risk populations tend to have lower ACE2 levels paradoxically, since that is the protein that the virus uses to enter cells. ACE2 levels drop as we age. They tend to be lower in males than females. They tend to be low or relatively low for the disease pathology in patients with obesity, with hypertension, particularly those not on ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, it tends to be low in folks with diabetes, uh, as well as folks with coronary artery disease. Um, so how can we explain these clinical manifestations? Um, largely through an imbalance in the renin angiotensin system. Um, this diagram is sort of showing what's going on with the pathology. You can see that the virus is binding to the ACE2 receptor. When the virus gets inside of cells, it actually directly activates P38 MAP kinase. P38 MAP kinase seems to be a central hub in the mayhem that is caused by the virus. Um, it actually will cause release of, of uh, inflammatory cytokines, uh, including uh, what used to be called TACE, TNF-alpha converting enzyme, um, which both releases TNF into the circulation, but also binds and cleaves the ectodomain off of ACE2. Uh, P38 map, map kinase also reduces expression of ACE2 um, and causes internalization of the receptor. Uh, this is problematic because ACE2 converts angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1-7 as its day job when it's not serving as a viral receptor. Angiotensin 1-7 is a counterbalancing uh, peptide in the renin angiotensin system and tends to have diametrically opposed effects to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 binds to the angiotensin 2 receptor type 1 when it activates that receptor, that again will, will phosphorylate P38 MAP kinase. Um, and you can get caught into a vicious loop if you don't have angiotensin 1-7 to counterbalance. Angiotensin 1-7 binds to the MOS receptor, and when it does, it actually downregulates activity of P38 MAP kinase. In addition to the inflammatory cytokines and destruction of ACE2, P38 MAP kinase um, causes thrombosis. It actually causes um, damage to the endothelium, it causes uh, increase in tissue factor. This in turn will increase release of large, very large von Willebrand factor multimers, uh, which are involved in the thrombosis, uh, also involved in vasoconstriction, and also activates hyaluronin synthase, which is responsible for the increased hyaluronin levels that we eventually see in patients' lungs. So uh, I set out to try and repurpose two drugs, ulenistat and angiotensin 1-7, to block these effects. Um, both of these drugs are endogenous human products. Ulenistatin is produced by the liver, also called urinary tryptin inhibitor. And angiotensin 1-7, as I mentioned, is converted from angiotensin 2. Um, they have pleiotropic effects, mildly vasodilatory, anti-inflammatory, cytoprotective, prevent fluid, fluid leakage, prevent thrombosis, prevent macrophage M1 polarization, and also uh, angiotensin 1-7 has been shown to have antifibrotic effects in animal models. So angiotensin 1-7 has been previously dosed in humans, primarily via the subcutaneous route, although it has been given in uh, pharmacologic research studies intraarterially and intravenous has a relatively wide therapeutic window, but the way it's been given subcutaneously can be problematic because it has a binding to the AT1 receptor that several orders of magnitude and affinity below that of angiotensin 1-2, but those levels are in fact achieved with once daily dosing subcutaneously. Um, we propose to use a continuous IV infusion to just get mildly superphysiologic levels. Um, Great preclinical data in animal models of acute lung injury, showing reduced injury, improved function, uh, reduced inflammatory cytokine release in, in lung fluid, uh, as well as reduced fibrosis in animal survival studies. Uh, in pediatric um, ARDS cases, uh, there's been reduced inflammatory cell count um, in the bronchialveolar lavage, as well as reduced inflammatory cytokines. Uh, Ulinostatin is approved for use in Asia. It's currently in a phase three clinical trial in India for COVID-19 by the company that I have 
I've been working with to source for our clinical trial in the US. Um, in non-COVID-19 ARDS studies, ulinistatin has reduced mortality by approximately 50%. Similarly, in sepsis studies, uh, in a meta-analysis of over 2,300 ARDS patients in China, ulinistatin um, had substantial beneficial effects. It's been shown to be extremely safe in extremely ill patients. Uh, it causes reduction in inflammatory cytokines, as I have listed, and increases IL-10, a protective cytokine. Um, the preclinical data in animal studies shows that it actually upregulates ACE2, as well as causes decreased mRNA transcription and protein expression of P38 MAP kinase. So if we return to our diagram, you can see that angiotensin 1-7 and eulinostatin are actually having pleomorphic effects in reducing the pathology that we believe may be happening when the protective uh, arm of the renin angiotensin system is disabled. Um, again, um, in the disease, you can see on the left side in red, the effects that we believe are happening from the imbalance of angiotensin 2 and increase in P38 MAP kinase versus what's happening on the right if we can reverse this process by giving one of our two drugs. In terms of sourcing these drugs, angiotensin 1-7 is extremely straightforward to synthesize chemically. Uh, with a little bit of academic funds, I was able to secure 100 grams, which would be enough drug to dose approximately 5,000 patients. Um, Ulenistatin actually currently is sourced from human urine, much like urokinase used to be. Um, however, we um, could make it in cell banks to make it more available. Um, and it, we are res receiving our drug from Bharat Serums and Vaccines, who is the biggest supplier uh, in the country of India. Uh, by the way, Stanford has agreed to make any COVID-related IP available to the world for free. Um, so designed a clinical trial, anticipate enrolling 160 to 200 hospitalized patients who are hypoxemic but not yet on ventilators and measure endpoints related to morbidity, time to recovery, as well as mortality. Um, what have we accomplished so far? We've gotten FDA approval for both clinical studies. We've secured the drug supply for both studies. Both studies are approved for use at Stanford by the IRB and our therapeutic review committee. However, we're dead in the water. Um, we need funding approximately $2 million per clinical trial to move further. Um, and that has been very challenging to get. Um, we also um, need to get into clinical sites in order to get the trials going, which of course we cannot do until we have the funding. Uh, once we have the funding, we hope to be ready to enroll within a month. Challenges, funding, trial sites, competing trials, and let's talk about challenges of repurposing in the midst of a pandemic. Um, obviously, in, this, in a pandemic, the most important metric is reducing the time to clinical adoption to get the drug to the patients who need it. We've had a wonderful response, as you've seen from both academic scientists and industry science, scientists, to mobilize promising therapeutics towards patients. But we have limited resources to move these forward. Um, what is going to prioritize where we go? Well, we've seen politics have, uh, certainly in the case of hydroxychloroquine, and that's probably not good. In the case of remdesivir, which seems to have some activity, um, really got in on a first come first serve basis. Um, Self-funded trials that are, that are sponsored by industry, I think certainly have a leg up in resource constraints, constraint setting. Uh, I think it's really critical when we move products forward repurposed or otherwise, that they will be scalable, that we can get them out to the many, many patients who will need them very quickly. Um, and of course, scientific merit should be one of the leading uh, selection criteria whereby we move things forward. And the question is, who decides uh, what, what moves forward based on merit? Uh, sticking with the landscape, I think both the NIH and FDA's efforts have been truly heroic. I think their scientists are working incredibly over time to try and move things forward. But I think it's fair to say that the agencies as well as other funding agencies like BARDA have been overwhelmed. Um, in some sense, there's a bit of a wild west because if you have the funding, you don't really need to go through NIH or FDA to get into clinical trials. 
There are currently over 700 clinical trials ongoing. Um, most are underpowered. Many, many are not randomized, and many are enrolling very slowly. Uh, there have been estimates that perhaps 5% are actually randomized and of significant size to give meaningful answers, so that's quite frustrating. Uh, we're also finding disparate results, even in drugs that we have confidence in. For example, the large US remdesivir trial uh, showed positive results reducing uh, time of hospitalization and gave a signal that suggested improvement in mortality. This was not seen in the similar size WHO study in Europe and the European Infectious Disease Group has recent, recently suggested that remdesivir not be offered to hospitalized patients. So let's talk about the US landscape in more detail. We currently have over 6,100 hospitals in the US. 3,500 of these have greater than 100 beds. Right now, there are 70,000 patients hospitalized with COVID-19, yet most hospitals are not enrolling patients for two reasons. One is they are lacking basic research infrastructure. They do not have the study coordinators or expertise to do so. Uh, and the second reason is that the really high volume sites who I've been speaking with, many of them are just overwhelmed. And if a study cannot seamlessly integrate into their workflow, they just can't do it. What has worked well? The recovery trial in the UK. It's a multi-arm master protocol. This is the trial whereby dexamethasone was shown to be beneficial and reduce mortality in patients requiring oxygen or ventilators. Um, near universal participation across the hospitals in the UK. It is a randomized study, but it is not blinded. Rather, once the randomization happens, all patients receive standard of care plus either placebo or the active drug. It's a very simplified protocol with minimal reporting. There's a one page case report form. It's very low cost. Um, because it is so large, it can follow clinical endpoints, doesn't really need to be capturing a lot of surrogate endpoints, really just safety and meaningful clinical endpoints. And as I mentioned, virtually minimal disruption of clinical practice. Um, as a guiding principle, I think in the US, as we look to future pandemics, we really have an ethical imperative to identify the most effective agents as quickly as we can to demonstrate safety and efficacy. And we need to do so across different populations as well as across different disease severities. What do I mean by this? Many of our ethnic groups have different polymorphisms in the proteins that may be critical for this um, virus to progress, or that may be critical to whether or not a drug is going to work. It behooves us to really try and look at that critically. Um, and also across different disease severities. For example, dexamethasone appeared to work well in patients on ventilators, slightly less well in patients who are on uh, supplemental oxygen and actually increase mortality in patients who are not on oxygen. Clearly that's important to know. We don't want dexamethasone to be using freely in patients who are not yet hospitalized and on oxygen. Um, the goal should be to quote randomize the first patient. How do we do this? Um, I would propose the following. Uh, since virtually every hospital has a relationship with CMS, the agency that funds Medicare and Medicaid, I propose that every hospital with greater than 100 beds have a clinical trials office mandatory that is funded by CMS. Um, they provide financial support and provide training and collaboration with NIH and the, tr the, the sites will be prepared for both inpatient and outpatient studies when the next outbreak occurs. While what we have downtime between pandemics um, we will all benefit because this can shift our national clinical research enterprise to more real world studies that can be done less expensively and more efficiently. Uh, number two, I would suggest that the NIH and FDA develop off the shelf adaptable simplified multi arm master protocols that could be rapidly deployed in these hospitals and outpatient settings if and when they are needed. The trial should focus primarily on safety and clinical endpoints and be as simplistic as possible. These off-the-shelf protocols could, in, could include the accompanying document templates such as investigator brochure, informed consent, and case report forms. Um, next, I think we should be assigning study arms across different regions of the US. If the UK can do simultaneously a five-arm study, we could probably have four five-arm studies ongoing in the US at any given time. I think we could also enlist regional panels of scientists and clinicians 
to help the NIH uh, and government agencies evaluate the scientific merit, feasibility, and scalability of various proposed study drugs for these trials. And then lastly, we should be enlisting regional or national institutional review board panels, ethics committees, and if they approve a drug for a trial, this could hold for all healthcare facilities in the country. Um, so challenges funding for clinical trials, again, lowering the costs through real world master protocol studies. Challenge identifying clinical trial sites. We make all healthcare facilities enroll patients under master protocols, and we have them prepared in advance to do this. And third challenge, competing trials. A solution is that tr the drugs come in under master protocol assignment. Drugs will compete directly with each other and placebo only in these control settings. And we will not be having these underpowered non-randomized studies that are really just adding to the noise. Um, I wanna thank the funders who have helped me move as far as I could, and uh, I am ready to take questions. Great, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Kevin, for this very insightful talk. It was really a tour de force in, in sharing with us your first hand experiences and putting forward uh, the guiding principles. So um, there are several questions. So let me let me start with the first one, and um, that might come from that came from speakers that are also excited about computational modeling and AI. Sort of within the context of Spark, do your positioning projects uh, do they do they integrate with computational AI models in any way? Do you think that is feasible today? What would need to be changed, or is it more an aspirational goal for the future? No, thank, thanks very much, Marika, um, for um, sharing the question. Um, I really think taking AI and omics into virtually every project is going to be the way to go. I think this is one of the ways that we are going to reduce the excessive failure rate. You know, when we use reductive science solely to advance something into the clinic, um, we're showing something works in a cell line or perhaps an IPS cell line from a patient. Um, we may bring, bring it into some artificial animal construct in Eureka, we think we solved the disease. When in fact, when we move it into the heterogeneous um, population of humans with disease process that we do not fully understand, who have, have various polymorphisms and proteins, et cetera, um, and, and their genes, um, we fail. And we need to be much more integrative in our approach, apply both computer science, artificial intelligence, systems biology and do the reductive validation as we need to, to give us the confidence to move forward. Great, uh, another question that I have is, you have mentioned some of the challenges with uh, getting the funding for um, repurposing to pursue downstream experiments and clinical trials for repurposing uh, candidates. Um, how does repurposing of individual drugs relate to repurposing of drug combinations? Or perhaps does, are the challenges similar or even harder or easier to tackle in, from the sense of getting the funding or modeling the IP and so on? Uh, another great question. Um, in, terms of, in terms of advancing combinations versus single drugs, there might be one slight advantage and that you can sometimes get intellectual property around a combination of drugs um, for a particular disease. Um, and that could be perhaps enough to convince investors to support you to move, to move your trial forward. Um, if you're not getting that intellectual property advantage, then it's probably slightly harder uh, to do the combination of drugs. But, but um, you know, we have, repurpose trials where we've run small studies at Stanford. I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we have worked to repurpose tacrolimus to treat pulmonary arterial hypertension, found it was disease modifying, ran a small biomarker study where it actually worked extremely well, literally got three patients off the transplant list. And this was at the lowest dose that exists on the shelf, far below immunosuppressive doses but we were unable to get funding to move this forward. Eventually a company came and licensed it, up, licensed it out of our tech transfer office, which um, surprised me. Um, but um, getting the funding to move something forward, that probably would have been a million dollar study. And we would have been done by now, published a paper, 
hopefully change clinical practice and have the first disease modifying drug out for PAH. So these are really, really important issues we need to solve. The for-profit sector cannot solve them for us. We're going to have to get more reliable funding from federal agencies, from philanthropic groups, perhaps even from the payers, because we could have done that clinical trial for the cost of approximately one lung transplant. Um, so as, as a society, we need to get together and figure out how we're gonna support these promising studies and not just um, allow everything to revert to the for-profit sector because the for-profit sector has a fiduciary responsibility uh, to maximize profit for their investors. They cannot participate in these studies. Exactly. Uh, thank you so much for clarifying this. Uh, there's another question related to, can you discuss relative rates of failure as we move from computational modeling to clinical trials or from early to late stages of drug development? How often does a repurposed drug that is predicted to be efficacious fail then in cell model versus animal model versus clinical trial? Can you, can you share your perspective and experience from Spark given, that, given how many drugs you have repurposed within the Spark Center? Yeah, I, I can. Um, and the reality is the computational um, models that we have run that have suggested drugs, um, they actually have virtually all worked in cell models. Um, and a number of them have worked in animal models. Our actual failure rate um, moving into the clinic is relatively low compared to what you would see. So, you know, we're not going to fail for safety because we already mostly understand what that's happening, even if we're going into a different patient population. Um, I would say we fail in the neighborhood of 20 to 25% of the time when we get into the human trial, which, you know, compared to a 14% success rate for um, a new chemical entity is pretty darn good. Yeah, that is that is fantastic. So on that note, uh, let's conclude here. Thank you so much, Kevin, for taking the time and joining us today.